Welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast with host Philip Rendell, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Hello again, and welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast. Uh, my name is Philip Grindel, and I'm from uh, Diffuse, and I'm delighted today to have Russell Palarea, who is the founder and chief executive of the Operational Psychology Services. Russell is an internationally recognised expert on threat assessment, insider threat, protective intelligence, and counterterrorism, providing consultation in these areas to Fortune 500 corporations, global security firms, law enforcement, U.S. government agencies, and universities. Russell has been an active participant in the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, ATAP, since 1996 and previously served as the president from 2017 to 2021. Russell, I'm absolutely thrilled to uh, have the opportunity to, to spend some time and chat with you today. Can you just elaborate a little bit on your on your bio in terms of um, anything I've missed or, or, or you know, how you got into this environment, how you got into this subject matter? Sure, and thank you for having me, Philip. I appreciate being on your show. Uh, my background is as a forensic clinically trained psychologist working with law enforcement. So I spent 10 years consulting on investigations for the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS, like the TV show. And I was working across the board, violent crimes, counterintelligence, counterterrorism, uh, the, the breadth of NCIS investigations. And that included threats against the leadership of the Department of Navy, which is their protective security operations department. From there, I started my own company, Operational Psychology Services, and began consulting with Fortune 500 companies, including their protective intelligence units and their workplace violence prevention and insider threat units. And there's uh, much overlap between those since those three different units are all doing some kind of harm prevention or violence prevention program. In addition to that, in 2012, I was uh, contracted with the U.S. State Department Diplomatic Security Service, working for the Office of Protective Intelligence Investigations, and that work focuses on protecting the U.S. Secretary of State and the other leadership, as well as our embassies and consulates overseas, and the foreign embassies and consulates that are here in D.C. and the rest of the U.S., uh, addressing any threats to those and preventing violence against those as well. So that sounds like it must keep you busy. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so th I, just, I, just... I try to stay busy. It, it's how I can keep my brain going and stay healthy. <laughs> so let's start from the beginning, because I think, I think a lot of people will not necessarily have heard of or necessarily understand the term protective intelligence. Hmm? You're, you're the expert. So what is it? What is protective intelligence? So I mentioned the three different areas of violence and harm prevention. And if you understand the three areas, you understand where protective intelligence fits. So from a corporate perspective, for example, most corporations in the U.S. at least now have a workplace violence prevention program. They are required um, by the government to have some capability to identify any uh, potential threat of harm to their employees and mitigate a threat. And that does include communicated threats and threats of violence, as well as faulty equipment and things that that law was originally set up for. So that's workplace violence prevention. The second um, uh, type of program is insider threat. And those were born out of the Bradley Manning WikiLeaks case back in uh, 2011. Uh, President Obama had issued an executive order requiring all U.S. government agencies to have an insider threat program. Now, insider threat has a dual purpose because originally it was focused on information security protection, prevention of espionage, and uh, in leakage of, of uh, sensitive information. But workplace violence, which we just discussed, also falls under insider threat because that's committed uh, many times by employees who have inside access. So the third category is protective intelligence. Now, we've discussed focusing on the employees. What we haven't discussed is focusing on the executives. So your senior executives within government positions, your C-suite executives within the corporate offices, that's where protective intelligence fits in. 
for example, in the corporate world and in the government world, people, um, the principals will have executive protection details um, that are there to do physical security work with them when they're out and about in case anybody attempts to attack them. What protective intelligence does is it gathers information about potential threats um, that certain people may pose to that protectee. Uh, for example, we may have someone who is writing uh, threatening and harassing letters to the CEO of a company because they're very angry uh, that the product that they purchased from the company failed and they want their money back and they are raising it all the way to the CEO's attention. Well, we know that person, um, they provided their, their name and their address, and we know that the CEO uh, is having a, a public address in the city where the subject lives. We're concerned that that subject's gonna show up. So we can use our, our knowledge of the subject and their grievance and looking at their threats and take certain measures in order to protect the CEO when they're in that city liaison with the local police to see if there are any known criminal records, criminal charges with that subject, or any known interactions that should make uh, us concerned that subject may act out violently against the CEO. Um, having the executive protection team uh, maintaining a be on the lookout uh, where we have the subject's photo and a description of the problems that the subject has developed against the CEO over time. Those are steps we can use being proactive to protect the leadership of a company. Now, the, the other thing about protective intelligence that makes it unique from the other two categories is that it's not only protecting leadership, but it's also protecting facilities. I mentioned things like the embassies and consulates, the corporate headquarters building, um, corporate field offices. Uh, instead of somebody committing an attack against their supervisor, or um, you know, a, a traditional workplace violence scenario, we have people that will attack companies because of a grievance. Uh, classic example of this was the gentleman who was in Tennessee and set off a very large explosive device uh, in front of the AT&T building on Christmas day. He had no intention of harming any people as far as we know, because he did it at uh, uh, in the early morning on Christmas Day, knowing that the streets would be empty, and he broadcast a warning telling everyone to evacuate the area before he killed himself in that large vehicle and that with that very large explosive device. So targeting of facilities, uh, and that is particularly important both for government and corporate sector, that we're looking at somebody coming to one of our facilities and trying to commit an act whether it's uh, with firearms, with explosive devices, with knives, whatever, with a vehicle, whatever that weapon may be. And then the third element of protective intelligence is protecting the organization as a whole. So sometimes people aren't threatening the CEO, they're threatening the company. And when they write letters, they address it to the company. So there's no one person that we're focused on protecting, we're focused on protecting the entire company, all personnel. This subject may drive up to the company headquarters and just park in their parking lot and lay in wait. And when employees come out uh, at the end of the workday, they open fire on those employees or run them over with their car. That would be uh, a demonstrative attack against the company without any specific person being targeted. That subject doesn't care who those people are, as long as they are representatives of the company, then they are striking back at the company as a whole. So that's what makes protective intelligence unique in the areas that it covers. And so presumably you need to know either who the person is that's posing that threat, or even if you don't know necessarily their identity, you know that there is an individual that is communicating or in some way has uh, come to notice as an individual. So it's not a kind of fishing expedition in terms of is there somebody out there that's posing a threat it's very specific about a a person that you're aware of and you're looking at that individual and that individual's behavior and communications yes so it's important to understand the concepts of defense versus offense reactive versus proactive in our world uh within the executive protection they are in a defensive posture Physical security around a corporate headquarters building is a defensive posture. 
we don't know who's out there and who wants to commit any kind of violence against the company. So we build tall walls and have security cameras and concertina wire and armed guards and all those things. And when the when the leadership of the company is out and about in the community, they have an executive protection detail um, that may be armed or at least is uh, ready to defend from any subject moving toward an attack against their protectee. Now, that's all um, defensive. What we want to do with behavioral-based threat assessment and management methodologies is be more proactive, which means identifying who out there may be thinking about researching, planning, or preparing to conduct an act of harm or violence against that protectee, that building, or that company. There are a variety of ways we can do this. Many times they come to our attention because they write angry letters um, or send angry emails or make angry phone calls. And they uh, have no qualm about identifying themselves to us. So we'll know who they are, where they live, and what they're angry about. Now, more recent times, social media has be, played a very important role in protective intelligence. When companies are out there looking for people who are mentioning their company and their product, they will come across angry customers. Uh, just go on Google or Yelp or any of those, you'll find plenty of angry customers and bad reviews. But what the company is looking for from the protective intelligence security role is the person who is extremely hostile, discussing violent themes, communicating threats of violence, demonstrating a fixation on the leadership or on the company as a whole. Those are the risk factors that make us concerned that individual may be moving toward an act of violence, or at least is so fixated on the company, they're not letting go, and their hostility is escalating. That escalation may result in them making an approach to the CEO or uh, a company's facility. And even if they don't have the intent to commit a, a, a violent attack against the entity they're approaching, they may still get violent when security intercepts them and tries to send them away and they decide to take out the pocket knife that they carry with them all the time and stab that security officer. So those are all the elements of being aware of people who may pose a threat to the organization and knowing if they are making approaches to the organization and staying on top of what they're communicating to the organization through emails, phone calls, social media, et cetera. So we understand what their mindset is and what their behavior is if they are escalating in violence risk. And let's get one of the big topics out of the way then. So what part does mental health actually play in these these individuals who, who come to notice? Mental health has been a, a very challenging topic to discuss when we talk about violence risk in the U.S. and globally. But the challenge we've had in the U.S. with the surge of mass shootings that we've had over the past, uh, say, you know, 10, 15, even 20 years, but they've really increased in um, in numbers over the past five to eight years. The politicians who are in front of the cameras, the media reporters themselves, often will communicate the message that this person is crazy, in quotes, um, that this person, they will use, use the term, has mental health issues. Well, I have a, a surprise for your audience. We all have mental health issues. We're all humans, and all humans have health issues, physical and mental. We've all experienced symptoms of depression at some point in our life. We've all experienced symptoms of anxiety. Uh, some folks out there will experience alcohol abuse or drug abuse. Some people will become psychotic because they dropped LSD or because they were sleep deprived, or they might have been so overly stressed they became out of touch with reality. But mental health and mental illness is so common in humans that it's not a useful construct to look at as a standalone risk factor for violence. What we're looking for with these protective intelligence cases is somebody who may be showing symptoms of depression or anxiety, but more importantly, they're showing despair, that they're at the end of their rope, or as my colleagues in the UK say, end of tether that they don't see any way out of their situation other than committing an act of violence. They may be diagnosable with depression at that point. They may be suicidal. They just may be angry. 
A lot of these folks don't have any formal diagnosis. They're just angry when they commit their attacks. And that's why we want to be careful about identifying symptoms, behavioral symptoms that may be indicative of a, a diagnosable mental illness, but sticking the diagnosis on the person isn't helpful in these cases. It's more about understanding their mindset and whether or not they're in touch with reality or not. And um, if we can actually talk with them to literally change their mind about committing the attack. If they're out of touch with reality and they have the delusional belief that the government is stealing their thoughts with satellites, you're not going to get very far talking with that person and trying to change their mind. Uh, however, if they're angry about uh, a product that failed on them and they're uh, moving toward committing an attack against the company, well, we can talk with that person who is grounded in reality and just really angry and try to diffuse their anger and find a way to get them off that trajectory toward violence by problem solving with them. I appreciate that that's a very novel approach. People don't think about problem solving, but many times in the corporate world, this comes down to customer service. And so um, even if somebody does have those diagnosable mental health issues, though, or mental illness issues, I think what's interesting is that doesn't mean necessarily, though, that they're not capable of rationally planning an attack. And so, you know, the danger of writing somebody off because they've got a significant mental illness or a diagnosable mental illness, but actually in the moment, they're behaving totally irrationally. Right. And that's the thing. Um, when people see symptoms of mental illness, uh, even, you know, security professionals, they don't have that psychological background to understand what it is and what it means to risk and violence risk. And what I generally will see is one of two pathways are taken. Either people downplay the risk saying, oh, that guy's just crazy. And they're not appreciating the risk that is present because of the mental illness symptoms in that subject. On the other hand, they may be overreacting, saying, oh, my God, this guy's out of touch with reality. He's going to come to kill us. And I say, no, he just has a psychotic disorder. He's not intending on killing you. So don't be scared by his psychotic symptoms. Some of these folks um, you know, will do things like have auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations. They look unpredictable, they look irrational, and it could be quite intimidating. Now, what I want to help the security folks that I work with and law enforcement understand is, yes, this guy is showing symptoms of, of mental illness, but doesn't pose a violence risk. There's nothing that suggests that, that this person's going to move toward committing an act of violence. On the other hand, we have that gentleman who believes that their uh, thoughts are being stolen by satellites. and they have started to make threats against uh, the company who makes the satellites. And they have started to show up around the company's facilities, making approaches. Now we're getting more concerned that that individual who has a delusional belief is actually moving toward committing an attack. And it's fair to say that more people with mental health become victims of, of violent crime than they do a perpetrator of violent crime? Um, it, overall, it is fair to say because a lot of times the public is looking at mental illness and getting intimidated or scared by it, but they're not understanding all of the times that people who have diagnosable mental illnesses are victims of crime mm -hmm. um, or end up in situations that become altercations where somebody is intimidated by their mental health symptoms and end up committing an act of violence against them, even if it's a uh, punch to the face. Yeah. Um, but we have to be very sensitive to people who have uh, diagnosable psychiatric conditions and what their needs are, and then looking at the risk that may be presented. The majority of them aren't going to be acting out violently. Yeah. And so when, we, when, we, when we're talking about people who are making threats, there's obviously this, this hunter howler concept. What's your perspective on that in terms of, you know, those who make threats and those who pose threats? How do you differentiate that? Well, we um, give credit to the origin of making versus posing a threat with Robert Fine and Brian Vosicule's work. Uh, they are the grandfathers of the behavioral threat assessment and management model. 
And their first publication was through the U.S. Secret Service in 1995. Um, they're friends. They're brilliant leaders in our community. And Making Versus Posing a Threat was one of the most important contributions that we've had to our field. We want to appreciate that uh, when someone makes a threat, we this is probably the first time that we've been introduced to this individual, whether it's government or corporate. And we don't know the actual violence risk that is posed in their threat. We have to do some investigative work to learn more about the person. Look at, do they have a history of criminal charges? Are those violent crimes or nonviolent crimes? Do they have, have a history of violence that was not resulting in criminal charges and arrest? Is this the guy that likes to go out to the pub every Friday night, have a few pints, and then get into a rumble? And just because that's what's fun for them on a Friday night. So they have a history of violence, but they've never been arrested for that for those violent acts. So we want to be mindful that when someone is communicating a threat, we always take it seriously. We always need to do some initial, initial triage investigation to learn a little bit about their background. So that may be looking at publicly viewable social media or any other internet footprint they have out there. It may be talking with the person who reported a concern to us. It may be a direct interview with the subject, just learning more about their grievance and asking some questions that will gather risk factors for us about violence risk. Ultimately, we investigate those threats. The ones that we start to find some concerning information, that's where we're going to dedicate our resources and have more um, investigator manpower, having more analysts conducting research, uh, learning more about that subject and the violence risk that they pose. On the other hand, we do have a lot of people who make threats for venting anger, for achieving a desired outcome. And they have no intent to commit violence. So in those situations, I mentioned the customer service problem. We can research, we can identify the, the background of the subject. We appreciate that we're not finding anything about violence risk in their history. And we talk with them and they say, you know, I'm so angry that my computer failed and I lost all of my data for my dissertation. And so I blame the computer company for this. And I threatened them because I wanted to get their attention. In the U.S., if you say, now I understand why co people commit these mass shootings, you will get their attention these days. And when you talk to these folks, many of them say, I, I don't have any intention to go commit a mass shooting. I don't own a gun. I don't have access to a gun. Never fired a gun in my life. I just wanted them to answer my email because I'm angry my computer crashed. That's why we have to do those initial investigative steps to know who we're dealing with and then assess the risk of violence that, that, that's posed. Uh, but if we look at if we look at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, look at Robert, uh, uh, Robert's research and the uh, exceptional case study project. And, and I, you know, I, I interviewed at the pleasure of interviewing Reed Murray um, a couple of months ago on this same podcast. And he talked about, in his experience, people who make direct threats. You know, he talked about sort of five percent of times that actually transfers into a genuine threat. Um, and actually, what what often happens is for the uneducated, if you like, is that we assume that if people make a threat, it is a threat, and therefore, you know, we we have this kind of thing: when's a death threat a real threat? And and actually, statistically, when we're looking at public figures and and executives and what have you, we sh you know, yes, we have to take it seriously. We have to look at it. But we can't assume that somebody who makes a threat automatically poses one. Correct. Correct. And so we have to do that background work because on the one hand, we have to take every threat as credible. If we are notified of that threat and we don't do any investigative work to learn more about the person and the situation and the motivation behind that threat, and somebody then goes and commits an attack, you know, that's our liability. Once it's brought to our attention, whether you're law enforcement or whether you're corporate security, we have liability once it's brought to our attention. We have to conduct due diligence to do some initial investigative steps and learn what's going on. Um, and therefore, we have people who make very scary direct threats of violence. They'll say, I'm coming to kill you. And um, their intent is just to scare people. 
or to say, I'm coming to kill you if you don't give me the benefits that I am rightly owed when you fired me. Well, they want their benefits. They don't want to murder anybody. Um, and we just have to do that initial work and then design the threat management strategies to get ahead of any attack that could be taking place. Like I mentioned, talking directly with the subject to get them to change their mind about committing that attack. So we ultimately won't know the credibility of that threat until we look into it, no matter how um, direct it is, no matter how violent it is. Uh, we have to do some digging to understand the motivation and intent of the subject in order to determine if they pose a violence risk. And is there any research around how it's been communicated in terms of, you know, we know that it's very easy to sort of send a, a threatening message on social media, for instance, mm -hmm. as opposed to taking the time to write a letter, for instance, or mm -hmm. physically saying it to someone. Is there any difference between how that message is communicated? Well, it is important to keep in mind that uh, we have a phenomenon called keyboard courage, that people, when they're behind their computer, are more willing in many instances to say threatening and violent things directed toward a person or an organization. And when you interview them, they will not show you any of that rage. They apologize for making that threat. They say, you know, I was just angry. I was behind my keyboard and I felt like I could say what I want to say. Um, and they'll really downplay it. When, and, and they're being honest. They're just, I was just angry. That's it. I, I'm not going to go hurt anybody. Um, so social media, uh, definitely we see the most keyboard courage. We also will see that in emails when people are uh, sending angry emails to government agencies or to uh, companies. And um, angry phone calls, that's more confrontational. So we'll pay attention when somebody starts making threats over a phone call because they're actually interacting with someone else and having to talk with them. Um, and the, it's just a higher threshold to directly communicate in a live conversation with another person, a violent threat. Now, it becomes more concerning if that individual makes a physical approach and communicates that threat, because now they're willing to expend time, energy, money, and resources into traveling to that target. Now, that target, the company headquarters could be, you know, a um, 10-minute drive from their house. But if the company headquarters is all the way across the country and they had to take an airplane, uh, now we're talking about time, money, and resources and energy invested, which makes us very uh, much more concerned about the potential for risk in that scenario. So yes, it does. The, the methodology in which someone communicates a threat does matter. And I, I noticed in your research, you, 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 um, you quote uh, a passage out of Inspire the ISIS publication around, um, you know, not always targeting people at work and the, and the reasons why you might target them elsewhere. Can, can you kind of expand on that? Yeah. Um, when Inspire um, was being published by Al-Qaeda affiliates, we became concerned that, and both from government and corporate world, because there was material um, being published in that, that uh, publication that was focused on targeting corporations and corporate executives. And the concern is um, that you have this organization trying to educate its followers and potential followers about target vulnerability. So somebody may be thinking, you know what, I'm gonna target that company and I'm gonna make an approach to that company's headquarters. But the company's headquarters is fortified. And they may not understand physical security and they may not understand attack methodology. They're just going to go out and commit an attack. Now, when you have a publication like Inspire advising people, no, don't go after the building. The building is fortified with security. Go after the people when they leave the building. That's concerning because from any organization's perspective, they have control over the safety of their personnel when the personnel are in their facilities. But once they leave the facility and they go to their local coffee shop and they go home and they go to a movie theater, the company can't protect them everywhere all the time. And so it is concerning when you see uh, adversaries publishing, advising, go target these individuals when they're more vulnerable. Um, because ultimately it comes to each and every one of us knowing physical safety measures 
and keeping in mind our safety when we're outside of our workplaces. And and it's interesting because in the UK, certainly, I don't know about the US, but certainly in the UK, one of the methodologies going back, you know, pre-Al-Qaeda and ISIS and everything else, back to the animal rights uh, Mm -hmm. activist movements, that's Mm -hmm. exactly what was in their playbook, was they Mm -hmm. would take the fight to your home address because they Mm -hmm. could they could become far more intimidating to your family and then your family start persuading you and, and, and talking to you around, is this really worth it? You know, are we doing the right thing, et cetera. So, so it's interesting that, that that's become a kind of a, a terrorist tactic and it started out very clearly as an activist, uh, although some people mm-hmm. would equally argue those are terrorists, but an activist uh, technique as well. So that's not a new phenomenon. So, so when we look at, I, I know you, you've got this, um, you're, you're attributed to this 2007 threat assessment model. Mm-hmm. Can you can you talk to us about that? What what does that what does that involve? So the 2007 model that Chuck Tobin and I published in the International Handbook of Threat Assessment, second edition, that is my unique model of threat assessment, behavioral threat assessment and management. It is based on the original work of Fine and Bosicule from their 1995 and 1998 publications. And it layers onto their foundational work with my operational experience from working with NCIS and diplomatic security and corporations and schools and universities. And so it just has a a nuanced approach to understanding the way someone is thinking, feeling, behaving based on cognitive behavioral theory, which is a foundation of clinical psychology. And then understanding the nuances of the social situation the relationships between the subject and the target, um, the nature of their grievance, and then identifying uh, any key risk factors with their emotions, with their thoughts, and with what they are saying and doing that suggests an escalation toward violence risk. So in my holistic threat assessment model, we're looking at factors within the subject. That's clinical psychology, individual factors. We're looking at factors within the context and the environment, that is social psychology. And then we're looking at factors within the subject's social network and their uh, organization, which is a hybrid of social psychology and industrial and organizational psychology. When you bring this all together, we have what I call the holistic model because we're looking at a whole person. We're now going to have not a 2D view, but a 3D view, a hologram of the individual looking at them in their life, in their life circumstances, identifying the life stressors they're dealing with at this time, the perceived grievance, looking at their background to see if there's any past history of violent attacks, communicated threats, criminal charges, grievances, fixation, and then looking at the current situation to assess the risk we're dealing with today. And with that, we can have a full picture of the assessment of violence risk with that individual, which then leads to our designing of threat management strategies to mitigate that risk. And there's a whole host of threat management strategies that we use depending on the nature of the case. And so what, what sort of signs of escalating are you looking for then? When, when you're presented with a case, are there some key signs that you think these, these are the ones that have a greater weight than others? Mm -hmm. It's going to entirely depend on the individual, the subject, and their case, their situation. Each case has its own nuances. But in general, if someone starts complaining to a company, the analogy of the computer crash. So they start uh, writing angry letters to the company about their computer crashing and losing their dissertation data. And the amount of communications they send picks up in frequency. It was one a week. Now it's one a day then the tone of those communications are starting to become more hostile, more sinister. They're not just angry about the computer crashing. They're starting to make references to, you better watch your back. You don't know what I'm capable of if you don't solve this problem. And then they may start making references to attackers of uh, past mass casualty attacks. So when you start to see that mindset shift toward adversarial. They're no longer an angry customer. Now there's someone who's actually trying to intimidate, even terrorize the company, make them fearful for their safety. If they make an approach, as I mentioned, that shows investment of time, energy, and resources. So that becomes extremely concerning. Um, And 
if they end up just increasing their frequency from once a day to uh, 100 phone calls in a day, that becomes extremely concerning. So we're just looking for that behavioral escalation or the shift in mindset that indicates they're digging their heels in in an adversarial stance and becoming more toxic, more volatile, more poisonous in their communications. You can hear condescension. You can hear entitlement. You can hear corrosiveness. Those are the things that make us more concerned that this subject is uh, becoming so dug into their adversarial stance that they may lash out violently. And so the more energy they're putting into this, the more uh, reticent they are to back down, if you like. Correct. And and that demonstrates the the level of fixation that they have. In some of these cases, the grievance that an individual has against an organization becomes their identity. You have someone who was terminated from a job and they felt shamed by that. And they felt that they were wrongly fired from that job. They will take on the identity of being the angry ex-employee who will do everything in their power to take down that company. They start creating websites that target the company. They're writing harassing letters or threatening letters to the company. They're protesting in front of the company's headquarters. And it just is their identity now that their sole purpose in life is to damage the brand and reputation of the company and terrorize its personnel. And, and then you mentioned four different types of workplace violence. Can you talk about those then for us? Uh, the typology of workplace violence that um, is commonly used in the U.S. was proposed by, uh, created by the University of Iowa back in the early 90s, and then has become the um, the U.S. Department um, of Labor's OSHA standards. Uh, and the other uh, organization within labor is uh, NIOSH. So these are, are U.S. government agencies that have developed and then promoted this four category typology of workplace violence. Now, the uh, type one, you're dealing with people who are um, have no relationship with the workplace. And so this is going to be your common criminal. They just show up uh, at a, a petrol station, pull a gun, um, demand money, and that's all they're looking for. Um, when you move to type two, you're going to have some kind of relationship. Generally, customers will fall into this rank. So that's our guy who's angry about the computer crashing and losing his data. Uh, type three is employees. So those are individuals uh, within the company already, or they might be former employees, but they have familiarity with the company, with the personnel. They have friendships in there. They have adversarial relationships with folks in there. And um, that is what we call our insider threat. Keeping in mind that once the person is fired from the job, your insider threat is now an outsider threat. Um, and then four is a very unique category, and that's familial relationships. So domestic violence entering the workplace, when we have a, a, a couple where the spouse is being aggressive to the victim, uh, abusing them at home physically, psychologically, uh, and assaulting them, and when that victim comes to their workplace, the uh, in the workplace, they are now being targeted by that spouse as well. So now you have risk not only to the spouse in the workplace, but also all of the employees that are there. There have been a number of mass shootings in the U.S. that went right along this line. One happened in the neighborhood where I grew up, Seal Beach, California, at the Meritage Salon. This is a very sleepy beach town in Southern California where a gentleman who had a history of domestic violence against his wife, the couple separated. They were in a child custody battle. And he had a number of firearms and he knew to find his wife, his estranged wife at work. He went to her workplace and he opened fire in there, murdering her, the owner of the salon and a number of other people. And then he went outside and shot and killed a gentleman who was just sitting in his car talking on his phone and then took off. And the police ended up identifying his truck, gave chase. He pulled over, got out of the truck, put his semi-automatic rifle down, had a bulletproof vest on. And it looked like he was intending on getting into a shootout with the police. Uh, thankfully, he gave himself up. But unfortunately, a number of people died that day. 
all because of this domestic incident. And that's why type four, while it doesn't happen often, it's really important that we appreciate that category um, of risk exists. We are concerned about domestic violence entering the workplaces. And so that's because... I mean, domestic. We know we know that domestic violence and intimate partner relationships is where the bulk of the violence is in terms of you know stalking, what have you, intimate stalkism or dangerous and other stalkers very often. But this is about proximity and about that. This is the known location. This is where I know I'm going to find that person, and therefore that's why mm-hmm. it enters into the workspace. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that's why we become extremely concerned that when uh, someone is in a very hostile or or violent relationship. And they break off that relationship and they go to a a quote unquote safe house location where their abusive partner doesn't know where to find them. The abusive partner often knows, well, they have to go to work, so I'll just wait for them at work. Mm -hmm. They may show up at the place where the victim gets their coffee, right, or goes for their their favorite pizza. Um, Just knowing patterns of life and anticipating uh, a point to intercept that victim Work is an obvious one. And so we do have situations where um, we have an employee who leaves a very hostile or violent relationship and they take out a protection order. We encourage those employees to notify their employers a protection order was taken out and the workplace was named as a protected location. If the workplace doesn't know that they're listed on the protection order, they can't help enforce it. Because if the spouse shows up and they don't know about the history of violence and the breakup of the relationship, then they say they call the victim and say, oh, hey, your spouse is here. They said they had to drop your lunch off for you rather than saying, oh, there's a protection order in place and we need, need to call the police right now. And so that's why the, the really important crux of threat assessment is communication amongst people. We no longer operate in silos. We share information with each other. The victim notifies the police, notifies the workplace, notifies their family and their close friends. Hey, I've got a protection order out. If this guy calls you, talks with you, tries to find out where I am, where I'm staying, what I'm up to, you got to let me know. And tells the workplace, if he shows up here, immediately call the police. It's a violation of the protection order and he can be arrested. And of course, the, the sideline to that, of course, is that that he then poses a, a physical threat to the security or the the, the, the boss or whoever interacts with that person, uh, because in in their view they're just getting in the way of his end goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And so another another really interesting bit was 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 the the relevance of key dates in people in the perpetrator's life. Mm-hmm. Again, can you can you kind of expand on that for us briefly? Well, you know, when we talk about anniversary dates in general. Uh, That's a really big phenomenon that security and law enforcement in the U.S. like to follow. There are anniversary dates like the attack at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado in 1999 and the attack uh, at the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, uh, that very large scale bombing. So those are watershed attacks that uh, other people who have the idea of committing attack will research will follow, and they will center their own attack dates around those anniversaries of other large-scale attacks. And the challenge we have is the more large-scale attacks that occur, the more anniversary dates there are, and the more potential for people to act out on those anniversary dates. However, it's really important to understand that the perspective of the subject is the perspective we must take in these cases. They may be researching the Columbine High School attack, or the attack on the federal building in Oklahoma City. But ultimately, they're not going to attack on those anniversaries. They're going to attack on their birthday, or the date their mother died, or the date that their spouse filed for divorce, because it's of personal relevance to them. So we want to be mindful of both public attacks and personal events in the subject's life. And we're not going to focus on any one particular date as the day of attack. What we are going to do is look for potential triggering events. Remember that we're talking about people making decisions to commit violent acts. There are often triggering events in a subject's life, something that happens to them when they're already thinking about committing the attack, and then the incident happens and they say, that's it, now I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go commit the attack. And we want to identify potential triggering events and, as best we can, try to mitigate those events from happening so that 
the subject doesn't make the decision to act out violently. And um, and do some dates have more relevance in terms of? I know it's about the person and of course their specific grievance, but but clearly in domestic scenarios, I'm guessing the kind of divorce or the or the you know child's birthday or something very very personal would be would be the one you probably might focus on a little bit. If it's a hostile ex-employee, it might be the day they got sacked or, or, or something mm-hmm. relevant. So mm-hmm. it's very much about the, the the relevance of a specific date to that individual and to the grievance. Yes, and that's why we need to conduct uh, an investigation. Uh, we talked about once you're aware that there's a violence risk concern, we have to investigate it to get that background on the subject. What is their grievance? What are the violence risk factors that are present? What are the potential triggering events? So through that, we may find the potential dates that may present as triggering events for the attack. And as we're learning about the person, we're going to be able to assess the relativity of risk of those potential dates. So we know that the subject falls into a depression on the anniversary of his mother's death. Mother died five years ago, but every year he goes into a depression and it takes him a month to get out of it. Now, he's been angry with his former employer and we're aware that he goes into the depression. But now that he has an adversary that he's becoming hostile and aggressive toward when that depression is coming and we know it's going to come. That's when we're more concerned about him acting out violently, because, as I mentioned, end of tether, he becomes desperate and sees no way out. So this is the year that that depression leads to suicidality, which leads to the decision to commit the attack against the adversary and then kill himself. So that's how we identify relevant dates. And then moving forward to potential opportunities to intervene in terms of to interview the individual and go and meet that person. What what are we thinking about when we're planning whether we should do that and, and, and how we do that? So it is important to appreciate that some cases, one of the very first things we'll do is interview the subject, Uh, people who are desperate for help, um, and they feel like their communications and their pleas for help have gone unanswered. That's a situation where they are reaching out for help. So it's not a surprise that the organization, the security department, or if they're a former employee, HR, human, human resources, or the police uh, will go in and interview the person immediately just to say, hey, we heard, we received your complaint, your concern. Uh, how is it that we can help? Just to try to stabilize the situation and get them calmed down. On the other hand, we may have an individual who we believe poses a credible threat of violence and is slowly moving toward committing that attack. We may not want to tip off that person that they're now being investigated. So we're going to do our own investigation and talk with people, learn about their background, and then gather enough information that we feel confident we can go into an interview with that subject, understanding what their problem is and how to uh, establish rapport with them so that we can negotiate with them to talk through the problem, problem solve it and get them to walk away from the idea of committing that violence. We don't want to see them die. We don't want to see anyone else die. We don't want their kids to be without a parent. We don't want their dog to be without a parent. We want everybody to be able to live in happiness and harmony. And if we can get through this grievance and resolve it, then the subject can return to a happy and productive life. And so that's how we take that problem-solving approach And when you're in gathering uh, information in a subject interview, in threat assessment interviews, it's not just information gathering, it's building rapport, building liking, ultimately establishing trust with the subject when we can, so that when the subject says, look, in the future, I'm going to call and I'm going to threaten the company again, and that representative from global security says, don't do that, call me. You have anything you want from the company, any issue, you want to threaten someone, you want to vent some anger, just call me. Talk with me. I'm here to help you through this situation. And that way you've channeled all of the anger and grievance away from the CEO, away from the human resources folks, and a person in global security who's trained to handle that level of stress and reduce the stress and the risk in the subject can now be the single point of contact. 
And is there a a preferable place, a location in in terms of having those conversations? I mean, do you go to their home address, or or does it really depend on the circumstance? Uh, really depends on the circumstances. If we can go visit someone at home, that's great because they can feel comfortable in their environment. But of course, we're always concerned about officer safety issues. Um, if the police were going to enter the home. Uh, or if uh, the security department uh, from the company was going to an employee's home, we want to make sure that nobody's going to get hurt. So more often in the corporate world, you'll see those interviews taking place either in the workplace um, or just on um, a Teams call or a Zoom call or a you know Google yeah. uh, call, just an online conversation so that you can still have a face-to-face -face conversation, but there's no risk of anyone getting hurt because you have the distance of the computer between you. Yeah. And lastly, can we talk about safety plans? Um, mm -hmm. you know, what are they and what do they what do they what do they what do they look like? How how do they work? How how do you how do you implement them? So we discussed earlier that there are two uh, types of safety that need to be considered. Safety within the workplace and then safety outside of the workplace. Uh, for uh, the scenario of um, uh, corporate leadership or corporate personnel being targeted, for example. And within the workplace, there are things that can be enhanced, physical security enhancements uh, at the workplace, improving the camera, security camera system, installing more cameras, high definition cameras, um, uh, improving access control at the company and uh, improving lighting in the parking lot and increasing the security perimeter so that it's not just the building, now it's the building and the parking lot that are protected. So those are all steps at the workplace. The challenging thing that we discussed before is outside of the workplace, we, we have to give the uh, potential targets of violence um, safety plans so that they're thinking about safety at their home. They may not have a home security system and it may be quite effective for them to install one. They may not be thinking about varying their routes to and from work or not going to um, the places that they often frequent for coffee or pizza or whatever, uh, varying their routes, varying their locations visited so that they are not time and place predictable. That's extremely important so that they're not being intercepted by someone. It's always going to be unique to the case uh, in terms of what recommendations that we give to a particular uh, a potential target of an attack. And we'll look at the nuances of the case, the distance between the target and the subject, the amount of resources that has to be put into making that approach, um, the violence history of that individual making the approach and assessing the level of risk to a particular target. And obviously, the higher the risk is, the more resources will be poured into um, ramping up the security measures to protect that individual. That's been a fascinating discussion, and it's flown past. It's nearly an hour we've been chatting about this, and it, it, it's clear, um, you know, your passion and your, your expertise, and it, it's a, it's such an important subject because there's so many there's so many nuances to it, and and I I you know I I kind of feel that the climate we're in now, both in the US and the UK, where we're increasingly kind of binary in our in our views on things and, and these sort of hostilities seem to be bubbling everywhere in terms of um you know the workplace, the, the home place and all every kind of issue that goes on now, that the, these issues are going to be more and more uh, prevalent and 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 uh, you know not just the school shootings, not just the the kind of incel movement, but you know, disputes between individuals, disputes between employers as potentially the economy changes and, and, and people are laid off and what have you. So I, I think, you know, I, I'm hugely grateful, Russell, for, for your time and your, and, the, the, and your expertise and your, you know, your, your uh, ability to really kind of communicate that to us because it's, it, it's been so helpful and so interesting. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to have had you as a guest on, on, uh, on, the, on the podcast and I'm sure that uh, the listeners will get so much out of that. Is there any kind of final sort of nugget of wisdom that you've held back that you want to share with us before you, before you go? Um, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, for your listeners and for everyone out there, the public, it's really important that people understand that this is not a law enforcement problem. It's not a mental health problem. It's not a family problem. It's everyone's problem. And we're all part of the solution. 
The police may not be seeing the concerning behavior, but the family is seeing it. And it's up to the family to notify the police or notify that former employer. Tell somebody that there's something concerning going on. If we start talking to each other, we put those pieces of the puzzle together to understand what we're dealing with, with risk of this subject. We have to have people pay attention, maintain situational awareness, recognize when you're seeing something that makes you concerned that a person may be acting out violently. If the hairs on the back of your neck are standing up, then you have a concern for violence, you need to tell somebody. So that notification is step one. Now the entity that's notified needs to know how to investigate this, whether that's the local police, the federal police, the company, the school, but they need to understand this threat assessment model. There are a number of great publications out there that discuss how to conduct these investigations, but it's important for the public to understand these are not investigations into elements of a crime going for a prosecution. These are investigations into violence risk factors that may lead to a person making a conscious decision to commit a violent attack. And once we've got the information gathered in the investigation, now we implement the management strategies. And that may include the police, and it may include the mental health clinicians, and it may include the family. What's important there is that they're all working together as a team. This is a team approach. It takes a team solution. The family communicating with the police, communicating with the clinicians who are treating the subject, um, all sharing that information so that we're aware of the level of risk and how to get that person to ultimately change their mind and not act out violently. And the key element here is that protective intelligence is around prevention. It's not around mm -hmm. prediction. It's about trying to prevent somebody doing something violent. Because we ultimately cannot predict human behavior with 100% accuracy. So in the threat assessment and management world, we don't discuss prediction. We discuss assessment. We can assess the level of risk posed. We can assess probabilities. We can't predict. But once we've assessed, if we have a violence risk concern with that subject, we have to implement that management strategy because we detect risk. We now need to mitigate risk. Brilliant. Brilliant. Russell, once again... Thank you so much for your time. It's been uh, uh, an absolutely uh, fantastic discussion. And uh, from all here at the, uh, the Online Bodyguard, thank you very, very much indeed. Yeah, fascinating uh, discussion there with Russell. And, and just for any of the listeners out there, I mean, should any of these, the issues that we talked about today, any of the uh, workplace violence issues or other issues that we discussed, if you are experiencing those, if you, are, uh, if you know someone that does, you know, reach out to us here at Diffuse. That's what we're here for. And uh, we can help and uh, we, we, we really would love to hear from you. So anybody that's got any concerns or has heard anything today that um, sparks something in them, give us a call at Diffuse or email us and uh, we'd look forward to hearing from you. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Online Bodyguard podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse. Please rate, review and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms.